to him. No, your wild's book. Your wild's book. Sorry. Number 24. Wild's book number 24. here. You guys from the spa? Yeah. Hey, say welcome. welcome. We're glad you're here. Thank you. You're very welcome. Let's keep on singing. Uh, number 41 in the Wilds book here, number 41, Worthy of Worship.
shall we? Let's pray. Lord, thank you. You are certainly worthy of our praise. We thank you for your wonderful goodness to us, for Jesus who died, who rose again, who saves us, who keeps us, who enables us for life and ministry. Now tonight, use this time to encourage us, point us to the Lord Jesus, and give us what we need, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 123 in the hymn book. 123 in the hymn book. I'm hoping that we know this one. How many of you know it? Nobody? Uh-oh. We better take it slow. Grace is testimony. Would you come on up, please? She had uh, an interesting time at the Wiles. A CIT. You always hear them called about CIT. You know, how many of you know what CIT is? Okay. It's counselor in training. Now, how many of you know what it is? Is that right? It's not that what it is? It's camper. camper in training. <laughs> See, I'm the only one who didn't know, but you, you get the idea. Okay. All right. Talk to us, please. All right, for camper and training, we um, you're there for a total of two weeks. You um, the first week is mainly um, sessions, and you're in your own cabin of CITers. And then the second week, um, you usually get put into your own like cabin without any CITers. But they haven't done that since COVID, so I didn't get to experience that. But um, anyway, it was good nonetheless. Um, this year we had two speakers, Jim Newcomer and Zach Sparksman. And overall they were really great speakers. I was very sad when they had their last session with us and um, I never got to hear them ever again. But it's okay, I had Willie, so it was okay. Um, two things that God has really spoken to me over the past two weeks is um, my unwillingness to forgive. Um, 
I would tend to hold grudges and I would tend to um, not want to forgive people because I knew that my relationship with them would change. And um, it would be riskful, it would be vulnerable for me to ask them for forgiveness or even ask God for forgiveness. And um, if you could pray for me going forward with my walk through forgiveness and um, help me not to hold grudges. <laughs> um, and secondly, um, God has really spoken to my heart about my pride. On Wednesday of the first week, um, in the morning game, I twisted my ankle. And um, in a way, it hurt my pride more than my ankle did. And because um, I'm, I'm very competitive. Um, if you ever played a game with me, you know I don't like losing. OK? Um, <laughs> if you beat me, I will not talk to you for a little bit. <laughs> but um, it really hurt me that I couldn't. I, I was hurt before the big ball volleyball game, which if you all know me, I love volleyball. And if it's a big ball, I love that too. Um, but um, it has really showed me that um, playing in competition, I wasn't glorifying God through any of that. I was glorifying myself, and I wanted to win. I wasn't, I wasn't winning for God. I was winning for myself. And um, if you could pray for me as um, I grow in my work through my pride and everything, that would be also very great. And finally, I would highly recommend this to all of you in front of me doing CIT because it is a great experience. I have met a lot of people, um, probably new best friends along the road, and it, it was so much fun, and it was the best two weeks of camp I could ask for. Thank you. That's all right. That's good. Forgiveness is giving to somebody else what they don't deserve. Isn't that what it is? Because that's what we get when we trust Christ as Savior. We get what we don't deserve. We get righteousness of Christ. We get heaven. We get blessing here on earth. And we deserve none of it. But the Lord has forgiven us. How could we not forgive others? That's a lesson that we all need to learn again and again and again. Let's see. 135 in your hymn book. Savior like a shepherd lead us. 135. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. men's turn, all right? <laughs> Verse 3.
uh, the bulletin. After the service tonight is the money shower for Kayla and Jonathan. Curtis, be sure to stick around for that. And also looking ahead, <clears throat> on July 25th, <clears throat> our teens are going to do the dairy bar at the 4-H fair. That, what that is, is they, they, make ice, they serve ice cream all day long for people that come. Uh, we're going to need some help with that. So we are inviting college and career people as well as parents of the teens. Am I doing right, Todd? Yeah, we just need some help. The, the group, after graduating uh, a lot out, the group is smaller. We need some help. We want to do a very good job for them out there <clears throat> uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, because we want to have a good testimony, and two, because they pay us $1,000 for one day. And then we vote, uh, the teens get together and vote and decide which missionary they're going to send that money to. And so if you'll help, who do they see? Who do they call, talk to? Okay, Todd and Christian, if you can help with that, moms and dads, college and career, let them know, because they're the ones that are going to be <clears throat> running around like they're chicken, a chicken with their head cut off if you don't show up and help them, right? All right, all right, good. Uh, and remember to pray for Tim Wesco again uh, down in, in this uh, Indianapolis and what he's doing there uh, for us as our representative. And I hope you'll take time to read uh, the back of the bulletin about what's going on uh, regarding uh, Indiana and the abortion laws and so on. Please do that. All right, take your hymn book one more time, number 336. 336. Redeemed. Let's stand together, please, to sing. Some of you came back this evening because you wanted to, to, to hear and see that tall, tan, terrific preacher that was so good looking. Sean is going to preach tonight. <laughs> He's going to help me out. So it's all up to you. Open the word and teach us, please. There he is. Well, I don't even know how to start after that. <laughs> You know, one of, the, one of the junior high boys came up to me and told me, hey, Asa said we have a guest speaker tonight. He said we're getting that missionary from Lowe's. <laughs> so uh, you guys keep that in mind with that dairy butter money, okay? <laughs> All right. Go ahead and turn to Matthew 28, please. Matthew chapter 28. Boy, easy crowd tonight. You laughed at all my jokes so far. This is, I don't know if I can keep that going. Let's see. <clears throat> All right, we're going to be looking at a very, very familiar passage. Um, I think most of us could probably recite this. Uh, if not, we're all very familiar with it. But uh, I want to take a look at it this evening, and um, hopefully we'll be able to um, gain some 
gain something from it here. Let's take a look here. In verse 18 of Matthew 28, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We're just going to jump right in here. But what I want us to look at first is, I want you to look at this almost like a sandwich. There's something at the very beginning and something at the very end of those red letters there. And we're going to look at both of those. because I, I think that that is really the foundation of what Jesus is getting at. You see, this is always called what? The great, great commission, right? What is a commission? What is a commission? It's when you're given a mission, right? So it's when you are, start, you are sent out to accomplish a task. This great commission Jesus gave to his disciples. We are his disciples. If you put your faith in Christ, this, this passage is for you. This isn't just for pastor. It's not just for Jeremy. It's not just for those of us involved in ministry. This is for you. God did not give us a great commission because some people someday would become missionaries. He gave us a great commission because he was giving us the mission of the church. That's us. This is our job, our responsibility. This isn't just his job. It's not his job. It's our job. Our job as believers in Christ is to follow through with these instructions. So I think it's really important we get right into it here. Look at the first phrase here. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So Jesus starts this off by reminding us that he has been given all power. The idea there is authority. He has, given, he has been given all authority in heaven and in earth. All right, is there anywhere else? Is there somewhere he doesn't have authority here? He's, he's basically saying, all authority is mine. I've been, giving author, I've been given authority over everything. You will never go to a place that is outside of Jesus' reach. You will never go to a place that is outside of his reign, his authority. He is king over it. He's in control. So the first thing here, we are, we are promised divine authority. He, his divine authority and his divine power. So I, uh, I talked about this a little bit this morning at the nursing home. Val said it was the first time she's ever heard somebody preach on the Great Commission at a nursing home. Uh, <laughs> probably. But, uh, but I, 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 hope you'll see, uh, I hope you'll see why I think that, that would be a blessing to them. When God gives us the command and he says all authority is given unto me, that means his authority is backing it up. That means that he's not sending us on something that can't be done. He's not sending us to do a task that cannot be accomplished or that may not, may not succeed. Who promised to build the church? In scripture, who promised? Who, who said these words, I will build my church? Jesus did, right? So at the end of the day, the responsibility for success is on him, not on us. Our only obligation is to obey, to do what he tells us to do, to be faithful. So he sends us out and he says, to begin with, he says, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. There's some things that should encourage us with that. You know, if, um, if my, I gave this illustration this morning, sorry guys, I'm going to do it again. So if my kids are told they need to clean the room before they can jump on the trampoline, and they're out jumping on the trampoline. And one of them comes to the other and says, hey, you're not supposed to be jumping on that trampoline until after your room is clean. What kind of authority does that come with? You think he's gonna obey her or she's gonna obey him? Not a chance, right? But what if, instead of saying, hey, you're not supposed to do that, and what if instead it's, dad said, clean your room before you jump on the trampoline, all of a sudden, what happens? All of a sudden, instead of going, I don't have to listen to you, jump, just keep on jumping, right? Instead of that, now all of a sudden it's, uh-oh. And then they scramble off that thing, run upstairs, hopefully, and clean their room. <laughs> Why? Because the authority didn't rest in the messenger. The authority rested 
in the one who sent them, right? That's the way it is for us. When, when you go and you try to share the gospel with somebody, when you, when you have an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus, first of all, because Jesus has sent you and it's his authority, you don't have to worry about the outcome. But secondly, it's, it's not you they're rejecting. It's, you just have to be faithful and deliver the message. That's all you got to do. So he promises us his divine authority and his divine power. Um, <clears throat> So we need to do our best to urge them to come to Christ. A um, couple of verses that came to mind here. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says this, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. He has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You know what reconciliation means? It means when two people are at odds are brought together as one again. Reconcile. Okay, uh, somebody has wronged somebody else, and then their their fellowship is restored, reconciled, to be made one again. So we have been reconciled to God. That's that's who we are by definition as Christians. We have been reconciled to God by Jesus, and then Jesus gives us the, this ministry of reconciliation and says, "Go, bring more to me." That's all. That's it's as simple as that. Verse 19 of that passage, St. Corinthians 5, says, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us a word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. We're standing in, in Jesus' place here. Be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You know, quite often when I'm talking to people um, about the Lord and they're really hesitant, they're really antagonistic to, to Christianity, to church, um, a lot of times, what, what, what's the, some of the things you hear? What's the, the, the number one? I don't want to go to church because it's full of what? Hypocrites. See, you guys, you know know thyself right no <laughs> just kidding um yeah so full of hypocrites why do they think that why do they think that well if you think that there is a scale in the sky that weighs your good and your bad and somebody comes and tells you hey i'm good friends with jesus i want you to come to church with me and you can become a good christian like me that's kind of what they're hearing they don't understand it yet their assumption is that you think you're so good that you can, you can they, they think that you're, you're looking down your nose at them like you're, you're holier than thou, but then they see evidence to the contrary, don't they? Yeah. It's almost to be expected that that would be the, the attitude. It's good for us to remember that as ambassadors for Christ, we're, we're just like them except for the grace of God. There's no difference. We're not better than any of these people we're trying to reach for Christ. The only difference is Christ has already reached us. He's trying to reach them. So we don't, we don't, um, we often don't have success when we're sharing the gospel because people see our inconsistencies. Often because they see our pride. Often because they misunderstand our relationship with God as though it's something that we did. That's why it's so important. Just get past it all. Just get right to the gospel. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner deserving of hell. I'm so bad, I deserve to go to hell forever. And it's not just like, you know, kind of, I'm not a good place. It's not boring there. It's eternal torment away from the presence of God. All that is good, all that is right, forever and ever away from him. That's what I deserve. I deserve that. I don't sound so proud now, do I? Share the gospel like it's real. And um, remember that at the end of the day, your success or failure has more to do with the power of God behind his word than it does with you. Your effectiveness is not where he starts off here. He doesn't say, if you take this evangelism program, you can then go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations. 
He doesn't say that. He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go. It rests on him. It's about him. It's not about us. We're just trying to be faithful and obedient. That's all we got to do. So he promises us his divine power. He also promises us his divine presence. Look at the last phrase of the Great Commission. Look at the very end. He says, lo, and lo, that just means behold or look. And behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So he promises us that he's going to be with us. When, um, when we read that word world, um, that's, a, that's a special word that means age. It means the end of this age. It means basically like the end of the time. Okay? So from now until eternity, Jesus promises he's going to be with us as we seek to obey him in fulfilling this commission. When we go about the task he's given us, he promises to be with us. Now, if I give my kids a big task, say, say we're, we're working on some project in the yard, and I give them a big task that involves shovels and wheelbarrows and lots of hard work. Now, dads, do you give your kid that job and just zero accountability, zero oversight, and just walk away? Come on, you don't do that, do you? Probably not, unless they're a little older. You're going to do what? You're going to be with them, right? There's a difference between the, 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 the contractor who comes out to do a job, or say you, uh, say you hire somebody to come clean your house. Ooh, wouldn't that be nice? Um, let's say you do that. There's a difference between that and when you have your six-year-old vacuum the floor, Right? Does, does, when your kids help, when they're really young, when they help, are they really helping? Don't you just have to keep doing the job? But it's worth the investment because, you know, it's developing them so that later they'll be able to do those things, right? That's kind of what's going on here. Go make disciples of all nations. Who's going to do that? Lo, well, I'm with you always. It's okay, I'll be with you. I'm going to go with you as you do this thing, and I'm going to help you. You're never going to be alone. You ever feel alone? As a witness for Christ, do you ever feel alone? In your workplace, do you ever feel alone? Now, I've got a remedy to that, I found out. You can just start hiring kids from Focus to work for you. It's, it's great. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly, you're not alone. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, it, sometimes we feel alone, though, don't we? Especially in regards to ministry, especially in regards to doing what God has put in front of us, our purpose for why we're here. God's given us a task to do. And he promises to us, he says, I will be with you until the end of the age. Um, thinking about that took my mind to passages of scripture about Jesus at the end of the age. I want to share these with you just real quick. Revelation 1.5, uh, talking about what the book of Revelation is, it says, it's in, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and was and which is to come, the Almighty. That's who promises to go with you all the way up until the end. Revelation 5.5. 5. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. No one in heaven and earth was found, and everybody mourned, that no one was found worthy to open the book at the end of time. But one was found worthy, Jesus. That is who promises he will be with you all the way up until that end of the age. Revelation 19, 11. <laughs> And I saw heaven to open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. 
and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, if you're thinking about that, are you afraid to go tell that clerk in the gas station about Jesus? Are you really going to back off and feel all alone and they're going to make fun of me? If you're thinking about who it is that is promising you his presence, he will go with you. He will be with you. One day we will be riding in behind him on horses. We're not going to be afraid of anything on that day. You don't have to be afraid. Jesus is going with you. In the Old Testament, Elisha stood against an army, and a servant was afraid. And Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes so he can see. And then all of a sudden, that servant could see what Elisha could see. Elisha could see that there there was this army in front of him in the valley, but All along the mountainside on every side was a heavenly army there. And suddenly, because his eyes were open and he saw that, he wasn't afraid anymore. I think that's what we need. We need to see the power and authority and presence of Almighty God right there. He's got your back. So when he sends you to do a thing, he's there. He's the one doing it. He's the one empowering you. You're not alone. Jesus promises his presence. It doesn't matter how difficult the task. It doesn't matter where he's sending you to do it. He promises his presence. Now that makes all the difference, doesn't it? <clears throat> Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, and be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because of Jesus' divine presence, because he promises to always be with you, there is no task that's too hard. You can do it. You can do it. Because who is it that's doing it? Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about your your persuasiveness when you share the gospel that makes it effective. It's the power of God. It's not about your courage. It's about trusting Christ because he's the one doing it. So that is is the, uh, the context of the command. Now I want us to look at the scope of the command. So we get to our main part of the passage here, verse 19. Verse 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. So, where are we to go? To whom are we to go? What does it say? All nations, right? So he says, go therefore. Um, that, that, that word go is, um, it, it's translated here as, as a command. It carries the weight of the command because of that therefore. I have all authority and I'm telling you to go, <laughs> right? So he didn't have to put it in imperative voice. All, all he had to do is say, going so as you're going make disciples or teach all nations that's really where the weight of the word is in the in the language there but he says he says go and that is in relation to the authority of the preceding verse so we're to go to all nations if we're to look at the parallel passage in acts chapter one it says uh, the same thing very similarly but he says it he says uh, in acts 1 8 but ye shall receive power After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And he starts there kind of like a, kind of like a concentric circles getting bigger and going out. He starts with the town they're in, and then he starts with the region, and then the neighboring region, and then the, the, the larger place, and then on the uttermost parts of the earth. So the idea is not that the Great Commission, in order to obey the Great Commission, you do not have to become a a missionary and go to another continent. Chances are, folks who do that started in their hometown being a missionary. Chances are, 
God calling some of you to go become a missionary in Africa is going to happen after he burdens your heart and you go after Wakarusa and Napanee and Goshen. That's where we're to go. Right here. So going to the uttermost parts of the earth, that means just like saying, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. That means that this starts now and it goes on and just keeps on going. That, that word nation there doesn't just mean uh, country. It has the idea of people group. So who are we to go to? We're to go to anyone we come in contact with. As you go, where do you work? That's where you're a missionary. I'm a missionary at Lowe's. That's where I go. I'm there 40 hours a week, just about. So for 40 hours a week, I'm at Lowe's. I should be a witness there. People should know what I believe. Where do you go? God's calling you to go. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to, go, you, need to you know, pack up, sell your house, and move somewhere. It means you need to start doing this where you are. And to whom do we go? Uh, demographically, it's, it's every people group, every ethnicity, every language group, uh, whether it, every large city throughout the entire world, every every back in the middle of nowhere tribe we need to take the gospel to them that's why we're involved in missions that's why we support people who are going there we go where we go and we support people who go where we don't uh and that that is biblical that's what we should be doing and temporally how how long are we should we be going until the end of the age until every nation has received the gospel until every nation has people from it who have been made followers of Christ. That's, that's how, how huge this mission is. So he's, he's not giving us a mission that is, that is really measurable and doable in a short amount of time, is he? He's not giving us a task like if I tell my kids, clean your room before I get back from running errands, and I come back from running errands, that's a very finite set of time. They know they've got you know, a limited amount of time. We don't know how long we have. We have until Jesus comes back. But we're not going to run out of work to do until between then and now. We're never going to go, hey, that Great Commission thing, nailed it, done. Now we can just sit back and enjoy this thing because we got everybody's converted. You think that's going to happen? No. So we are to get after this business and we're to keep on working on it. So we looked at the, the scope. Now let's look at the heart of the command. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. The main verb of this passage is that word teach. And it's not normally translated teach. It actually is a verb form of the word disciple. It means to make disciples. What's a disciple? Who, who was Jesus talking to? His disciples, right? They knew what this was. What did they do in relation to Jesus? How, how did they interact with Jesus? They followed him around, right? He was traveling around teaching all kinds of people. And what did they do? They went around with him. And he would send them out doing, doing miracles. He'd send them out teaching. He'd send them out telling people about him, right? He, they would be the ones he would hand the baskets to that he just took that little boy's lunch and he's, he's breaking off little pieces of the lunch. And, you know, in the back of their minds, they got to be thinking, what's he doing? And they hand them the baskets and they go out and then they, they feed 5,000 people with that little boy's lunch. They were used of God. They followed God. They were his students. They sat at his feet and learned from him. That's what we are, learners. We, we have one who teaches us, Jesus. We sit at his feet and we learn from him. We spend time with him. Um, in, in, I think it's in Acts um, when some of the uh, disciples get pulled aside and they're, they're scolded and told, don't you preach about this anymore. They said there was a phrase that's used in there, something in effect of they could tell that these ones had been with Jesus because they weren't afraid. That's how we ought to be. They'll be able to tell we've been with Jesus. That's what a disciple is. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to make disciples. I'm a follower of Jesus. I follow Jesus. I learn from him. I do what he tells me to do. What I'm supposed to do is share the gospel 
so that other people can have that relationship with him and can follow him as well. We're supposed to be multiplying. So, so we are to make disciples. And uh, he uses two, two verbs here after this to kind of tell us a little bit more what this is. And just real quickly, we're going to go over those real quick. He says what? He says, go for, therefore teach all nations, and then two, two participles here, baptizing them and then teaching them. So those are our two points. Those two points go under making disciples. So typically we think of this as a three-step process, right? We think of conversion, baptism, teaching. But actually because of the structure of the language, it's actually those are the two parts that belong to the first. And that first part, conversion, is just implied. So how do we know this? Baptizing. Think of this uh, as the inaugurating and integrating people into God's people, into the church. So making disciples starts with this idea of baptizing. Now, if we were to take a little tour through Scripture and looked at all the parts, uh, all the places in Acts where people would baptize, you know what we would see? We would see over and over and over again a pattern. He believed God, and he was baptized. He confessed Christ as his Savior and then was baptized. And you would see that same thing over and over and over again. So when Jesus says, I want you to go out and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. Those are the two subpoints of the main point, making disciples. What is it he's saying? What happens when a person is baptized? Why is that a big deal? Why is it a big deal to be baptized? What do you think? Somebody's trying to say something. I can hear somebody talking. Shows obedience to Christ because he said to be baptized, right? He set this the example. He was baptized by his cousin. What else? Who are we identifying with when we, be, when we are baptized in the water? Who are, we, who are we identifying with? What's that? Jesus. Yeah, we're, we're being identified with Christ. But also with who? Us. Why is that important? Why is that important? Because we're identifying with fellow followers of Jesus. Because you're not a disciple of Jesus in isolation. You're not. You have brothers and sisters all around you who are there to help you, to remind you that you have the authority of, of God behind you, to remind you that you have the presence of Christ with you, to remind you of these things. You see, a lot of times we think of evangelism in terms of getting convert converts. And if I can preach a salvation message and somebody comes forward and says, I want to be saved, we go, yay, we did the Great Commission. The Great Commission is a lot bigger than that, folks. It starts with that. It starts with that. It starts with they trust Christ and are baptized. Now they're on the team. Now we, we've, we've started their walk with God, right? Now we've, we've gotten them in to our group, but we're still not done with the Great Commission. The Great Commission does not start with, st stop with conversion. It doesn't stop with baptism. That's the beginning point. That's the starting point. That's like, um, that's like Mikey, what he's doing right now, right? With, with going through this process of becoming a SEAL. I mean, this was really hard week, really hard week. It's just starting, right? He's just getting started. He started something much bigger. Now, it's a big event, but it's just the beginning. What's the second part here? And we'll be, we'll be closing with this. teaching them. So we are to go and make disciples with the, with the power and presence of God in our mind. We're to make disciples. We're to baptize them. We are to teach them. Now what is it we are to teach them? Evangelism doesn't end with baptism. It starts there. We are to teach them. We are to impart instruction. We are to explain. We are to expound. We are to instill doctrine. That's, that's all wrapped up in that little word, teach. So we are to take truth and we are to unpack it and, and, and explain it to someone. Okay? But what, according to that verse right there, what is it exactly I'm supposed to be teaching? What is it exactly? Look what it says here. Teaching them what? 
doctrine? Teaching them the Bible. It's not what it says. Look what it says. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So we're not just teaching from the standpoint of giving you facts. This isn't history class. We're supposed to be teaching to observe. That, it, that idea is to guard or to hold to or to, to, to make it theirs. How many of you grew up in a Christian home? All right, how many of you can remember a time when you had to struggle to where your faith became your faith and not just the faith of your parents? Yeah. You had to observe. It had to be yours. You had to guard. You had to own it. But we're not just teaching to observe facts and doctrines. It's to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be holding to obedience to Christ. Doing what he asks us to do. Following the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's, it's not just... Uh, um, so, so often, I, I, I grew up in different circles. I, I, I did not grow up in a church like this church. Um, uh, I grew up in a, in a, in a church that was, was a little bit different. A lot of good things, a lot of good things, but some things that were different. And uh, we're here on purpose, to put it that way. Um, we had like 300 missionaries, but we supported them for like $25 a month. But we were really, really good mission supporters. Um, we, we would constantly give out numbers. How many, how many bus kids? How many, how many, how many kids, uh, how many people were saved? Now, never mind it was the same kid every week. You know, or, or three, three nights that week, a kid came forward during VBS and, and, and say, prayed the sinner's prayer. We counted them all three times, you know, because <laughs> we were very evangelistic. Um, you know, we just, we just had a different way of looking at things than what we do. Um, that's not the Great Commission. The Great Commission isn't just passing out tracts. It's not just inviting people to church. Those are part of the Great Commission, and those things should be done. You don't get to the Great Commission without those things. But that's not it. You don't stop there. You start there. You take that kid who kept coming forward, and you invest in him. You talk with him. You teach him. You explain things to him. You don't just leave him hanging. There are no orphans in God's family. We, we bring them through all the way to maturity. How do we know they're mature? They're starting to do this too. We're supposed to teach faithful men who are then able to teach others also. That's the idea. That's why it's multiplication and not adding. I can add somebody to the church. That's pretty quick. They might not stay, but I can add them pretty quick. The trick is training them to then go out and find somebody else and bring them and to mentor them. Mentors, mentoring, mentors, mentoring, mentors. It's really neat when um, Val, Val, there's, there's, um, there's a young lady that Val meets with pretty regularly and um, that lady meets pretty regularly with another young lady who has invested in our daughter. It's pretty cool. That's the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be a web and a network of disciplers. We're not supposed to just think of this, this great commission as just evangelism, period. It's supposed to be everything we're doing. If what we do here is not found here, we probably shouldn't be doing it. This is, this is our charter statement. This is our mission statement for the church. Creating relationships where people are growing closer to Christ. That's what we ought to be about. And you don't have to have an actual, like, I want to be your mentor conversation. You don't. All you have to do is edify and build up other people when you interact with them. It doesn't have to be a, a you don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to have a program. Just invest in somebody else to bring them closer to Christ. That's all you have to do. But guys, that's what we have to do. It's our mission. This isn't just, you know, some guy up here telling you this. This is God. This is Jesus. Right before he went back up to heaven, he said, all authority 
is given to me. Wherever you go, you make disciples of every people group there is. We're going to spread across every language, tongue, tribe, people, every shade and shape and size. Everyone from every group is going to be made a disciple. We're going to baptize them. We're going to bring them into our fold. And that's not it. We're also going to teach them. I'm going to go with you and make sure this is done. That's what he promises us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us this mission. Thank you that you don't give it to us and it just rests on us, but you take responsibility for it. Thank you that we go in your power. Thank you that we go with your presence. Please help us, Lord, to go. Please help us, Lord, to um, invite people in to join us. Please help us to encourage one another to disciple one another, to make it so that we are stronger because we know one another. Father, I pray that you would uh, let your words sink into our hearts and change us by it. We pray this in Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate that a whole lot, a whole lot. Take your hymn book, please. Turn to number uh, 638. This is a good prayer to follow that message. Lord, I give my life to you. Take control each day. 638. Sing it to God. Don't just sing it. Sing it to God. so much for the good word from God's word this evening. Uh, we will have our little fellowship now uh, down in the Family Life Center and uh, hope you all come for that. Thanks for coming tonight, you guys from the spot. We hope you come back. Come back any, anytime you want to. Anytime you want to. We love to have you here. We love to have you. Please join us tonight for our little thing in there if you'd like to. We'd love to have you. Get to know you. Meet you. All right. Let's pray together. We'll thank the Lord for the refreshment and, and go down and fellowship together. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your kind hand upon us this evening. Thank you for the word that we have been taught and uh, reaches our hearts. Now, Lord, help us to be your servants. Help us to be compelled by your love to minister to other people. We ask you, Lord, for your gracious hand upon us uh, this flock this week may we serve you and please you because we love you and lord we pray again uh, tonight for mikey that you would uh, continue to heal his body and that you would 
raise him and help him to be able to finish the job that he has started, that he might serve you in this capacity for our nation. Now, Lord, thank you for the refreshment we're going to have. Now, in Jesus' name, amen. See you downstairs. Thank you.